Happy day, dear learners. Today, we will start our session with a thought-provoking question. Can there be any offense which laws and rules cannot prevent? Because the purpose of laws, rules and compliances are to prevent and punish offenses. But is there any offense that can escape the eyes of laws and rules? We will look at the answer to this question in, uh, as we move along with this lecture. But before that, let us look at two thrilling cases which shook the whole world and made us think about what kind of management is required in the 21st century. The year was around 1990s. This was when the US economy saw a slew of corporate acquisitions. That is, larger companies acquired smaller companies. And one of the most popular acquisition that happened during this time was by WorldCom. WorldCom was a very large company and in fact one very notable acquisition that it did was the, when it acquired MCI and this acquisition was considered to be so large that this WorldCom and MCI acquisition could become a, a monopoly, a little monopoly in the US. Now this WorldCom company is, 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 was one which was working with telecommunication and internet. So this is a brief background about this company. Now having this on the one side, let us also look at what was happening in the US economy on the other side. There was something called a dot com boom was happening or the dot com bubble. So what was this all about? It was during the 1990s and 2000s that the internet revolution started and a lot of telecommunications and internet service providers companies were being set up. Now in this framework, there was a sudden increase in the stock market value of all these internet service providing companies. Now this sudden increase in the stock market, so what will happen if there is a sudden increase in stock market, immediately we will all go and invest in stocks. So that is exactly what happened and this is called the dot com bubble. But the stock market is not stable, right? Someday it will have to fall down and that was called the dot com bubble burst. So when this bubble bursted, there was a huge crash in the US economy and this led to a recession. So what happens during a recession? It is well known that when a recession is happening in one particular sector, then all the companies and the corporates in that sector would have to face losses. But that was not the case with WorldCom. Surprisingly and suspiciously, World, WorldCom was registering profits. Was this because of some strategic business secret? Definitely not. This was because of some fraudulent means. The CEO of WorldCom, Mr. Ebers, and did a lot of fraudulent accounting methods along with his CFO, Scott Salivian. They did one small trick in accounting that made them cover up all their expenses and show them as capital gains. How did they do that? There is something called line cost or interconnection charges when it comes to telecommunication companies. For example, you belong to an Airtel network and your mom has a BSNL network. If you want to call from Airtel to BSNL, the Airtel company would have to pay some interconnection charges to the BSNL because it is going from one network to another. Okay, so this is called interconnection charges. This is a kind of a current expenditure for a telecommunication company. But very cleverly, what WorldCom did was it showed all these interconnection expenses as capital expenditure. So when something is shown as capital expenditure, it literally means like they have bought some new asset, which they have not. It's a current expenditure. So one side, their assets are going up. And on the other side, their expenses are remaining the same, but their revenue is growing up. So this means they have huge assets and huge revenue. How can this be possible? That is when an internal auditor, Cynthia Cooper, she is the heroine of the story. She bursted this uh, big mystery case and she found out what kind of accounting frauds were going on. She is technically called the whistleblower. So she was the whistleblower in this case and she found out that this was happening. And finally in 2005, Ebers was convicted for his offense. Do we have a similar case in India? Definitely yes, and that was the very notorious Satyam scam. In this scam, the CEO, Mr. Raju, he made illegal gains for himself to the tune of 2,000 crore rupees. 
And again, he, this, like the same case in WorldCom, he manipulated his accounting information, his accounting books to show an inflated revenue. Because of this, what happened? So once a company has a very, very high revenue, its value in the stock market would be very high. So a lot of people would come forward to invest in this company, right? So as it happened, a lot of people came and invested and investors got cheated to the tune of 14,000 crore rupees. And what is more ironical, this person, Mr. Raju, was convicted for his offense in the year 2015 and in 2014, Satyam got the award for corporate governance. That's how ironical our system is. So anyway, all these two stories I had told you to think for the answer, for the question that I had asked in the beginning, are there any offenses which can escape the eyes of rules and laws? And the answer is yes. Here are some of the examples. When we look at financial offenses, we're talking about accounting scams, misstatements, false statements. There is something called round tripping. What does it mean? You have a, a company here in India and you have a shadow company in another safe haven that is a foreign company. You send your money there, invest it back here and it goes round tripping. That is called round tripping and that's illegal. And then you have fraudulent billing and false transactions. Only finances can we do fraud? Definitely not. Even in the work culture, for example, timesheet and payroll falls. For example, you say like, you know, hey, I reported on 10 o'clock today, but actually would have come by 11 o'clock, right? And what about fraudulent claims? Like saying that, you know, uh, you know what, I went on this business trip on this, uh, you know, I went out and had this lunch and then claiming a false bill. And bribery and any other favors that you're giving. Any other? Yes. Nowadays, corporates are doing a lot of fraud in the name of CSR. You know that 2% of your uh, revenue should be uh, allocated for CSR, but this is not happening, right? So in the name of CSR, they invest in different places and it again comes back to the company. So these are the various ways in which laws and rules can be blindfolded and companies and corporates enter into fraudulent practices. And there are many, many more than you can imagine. So this is why we are looking at the concept of corporate governance, okay? Okay, so why, why do we need corporate governance? Isn't management enough? Because even in management, we're talking about ethics, we're talking about business ethics, work ethics, etc. Is that not enough? Definitely not, and here is why you should understand the difference between corporate governance and management. Governance is an overall vision of accountability and direction. It gives a direction to the entity on which side they have to go. Whereas management is more of day-to-day -day affairs and implementation of policies. Governance, the focus of governance is on overall control and direction of the company, whereas management focuses only on performance and results. Governance involves goal setting and policy making, whereas management involves only implementing the policies which the governance system has made. And in the governance, the system is non-hierarchic. In management, we see that there is a hierarchical stu structure. What do we mean? You have a CEO, you have a manager, you have, you have a hierarchical organizational structure. But that is not there in case of governance. Now, can we give a definition for corporate governance? Yes. And here we have a very, very important definition given by Adrian Cadbury. Who is this person? We'll come to it a little later. But let us look at the definition. Corporate governance is the system by which companies are directed and controlled. Note the word here, it is a system. Boards of directors and response are responsible for the governance of this company. Who is responsible? Boards of directors. The shareholders role in the governance is to appoint the directors and the auditors and satisfy themselves that an appropriate governance structure is in place. Who appoints this board of directors? Who appoints these auditors? It is the shareholders. The responsibility of the directors includes setting the company's strategic aims. So what should the directors do? Okay, the directors are elected, they are put in place. What should they do? They have to set the goals, strategic aims, provide leadership to put them into effect. That is put the strategic goals into effect, supervising the management of the business, and reporting to shareholders on their stewardship. 
the board's actions are subject to laws, regulations and the shareholders in general meeting. So do you see that out of this definition, there is a kind of accountability relationship between shareholders and the governance structure. And you must have also noted that in this governance structure, two people are very important, the board of directors and the auditors. Can we see another definition? Now this is a definition given by India's SEBI, a, a committee on corporate governance set up by SEBI. Acceptance by management of the inalienable rights of shareholders because as shareholders of a company, you are not just receiving interest, you are not a passive person, you have a right because you are an owner of the company by being a shareholder. Even if it is a minuscule percentage, you are still an owner. As the true owners of the corporation and of their role as trustees on behalf of the shareholders. See, this is the relationship. Shareholders are the owners. The board of directors are acting like trustees. They, because the shareholders trust them that their money would be put into good use and the company would be taken in the right direction. It is about commitment to values, about ethical business conduct and about making a distinction between personal and corporate funds. You need to make a dif difference between personal money and the office money in the management of the company. So this is the definition given by SEBI. Now if you observe these two definitions, what we can infer is that corporate governance involves two things, a structure and certain processes. When we are looking at the structure, we are talking about the board of directors, we are talking about certain committees like the auditing committee, or the information disclosure committee, etc. We will look at this a little in depth in a, in, a, in a different lecture. And also, it consists of certain processes, processes like corporate governance codes. When you have a structure in place, you need to have some SOP, right? You need to have some directions. If you are cooking something, you need a recipe, right? So you need a process here and that process is laid down by corporate governance codes. And here we also have certain board procedures. For example, there is an auditing board and that board should have a procedure on how to do auditing. Now this is what we call the structures and the processes of corporate governance. Now there are two main events that triggered the discourse on corporate governance globally. So we are talking about how this concept of corporate governance evolved. Now the first set of events is the series of corporate collapses that happened during the 1990s and 2000s. Why was this happening? We just saw that the, in the case of WorldCom, right? So like this there was a dot com bubble and there was also a real estate bubble. So a lot of things were happening in the 1990s and 2000s. During the 1991, the London Stock Exchange set up the Sir Adrian Cadbury Committee. Now do you remember the definition given by Adrian Cadbury, right? So this committee was very special because for the first time it spelt out the importance of corporate governance, not just that, it also established a link between corporate governance and the stock exchanges. Now once London started doing this, all the other countries followed suit. Canada also set up a committee, France set up a committee, the Netherlands, then Sweden and also India in this list. In the year 2002, along with the WorldCom uh, scam, there was also other big scams happening in the US. Another notable one would be the Enron scam and all this led to the enactment of the Sarbanes-Oxley Act. Now this gave a legislative backing to corporate governance. Now this was one set of events that happened in 1990s and 2000. During the 2008, the great financial crisis happened. This was so huge that this was termed as the next biggest financial crisis after the Great Depression. This was happening because in the US there was something called securitization of sub-mortgages. What do we mean by this? In very, very layman terms, your loans are converted into securities and stocks. This is a very, very layman term for understanding this. So because of this, what happened? There was a lot of collapse. The main reason behind this was the companies were very greedy in investing in different places, in showing a very high revenues, etc. And looking at all these things, the investors were lewd and they started investing huge amounts into the stock market. 
and because of this the entire financial system collapsed and globalization was at its peak during 2008 and this is like a domino effect when the US fell the other economies which are depending on it started falling subsequently. So the 2008 episodes restarted the discourse on corporate governance and they started thinking what are the mistakes we are making in the existing corporate governance system. So these were the two main events which triggered the discourse on corporate governance. Now let us look at in detail about what is the need for corporate governance. I will just tell you a small statistics here. The Pune based India Forensic Consultancy Services, okay, so this is like a research uh, team. So they found that 1200 listed companies in the Indian stock exchange have done some kind of fraudulent accounting. Now this includes 20 to 25 companies which are listed in the benchmark Sensex and Nifty. So imagine 1200 companies doing fraudulent accounting sitting in the stock market and we as investors thinking that they are all genuine companies. right? So this is why we arrive at the need for corporate governance. See there is a separation between ownership and control of a company. Let us get back to basics. How is a company owned? through shares. So shareholders are the owners. Can the owners take care of the day to day control of the company? No. So that is why they are entrusting this responsibility on the board of directors. So are the board of directors just enough to take care? No. We also need different checks and balances in the system. That is why we have auditing committees, internal auditors, external auditors etc and a lot of structures around this. So when the separation between ownership and control is necessary, that is where corporate governance is necessary. Second, to retain investor confidence. When will people invest in your company? Only when they believe that you are genuine. How do you tell them that you are genuine? By being transparent. How do you be transparent? By disclosing the right kind of information at the right platform and forum in the right way. That is what we call standards of information disclosure. So when we do such kind of practices, investor confidence is reinstalled in us. The third one, to avoid corporate collapses and financial crisis. We just saw how two major financial collapses triggered the concept of corporate governance. Can we be wise backwards? Like can we wait for a, corp uh, for a financial collapse or a corporate collapse to happen and then wake up and say, oh my God, I should have done corporate governance? That cannot happen. So this is a preventive measure. And finally, to go beyond legal enforcements and procedures. Laws are there, rules are there, everything is there. But we need to sometimes go beyond laws and rules and written records to, to you know, have that sense of ethics and values within us and, and take the company in that right direction. And that is why corporate governance is required. Now let us look at some of the corporate governance initiatives in India. Initially in the year 1995, the Confederation of Indian Industry set up a task force under the chairmanship of Rahul Bajaj and they released a report in 1998 called Desirable Corporate Governance. This can be seen as our first step towards corporate governance. Now you have to parallelly think what is happening globally. You know, only in the 1991 the Adrian Cadbury committee has, uh, has been set up and here in 95 we have set up the Rahul Bajaj committee in India. Second the SEBI set up the Kumara Mangalam Birla committee uh, and it submitted the report and had three important points in it. Number one protection of investor uh, interest, number two ensuring transparency and number three ensuring standards of information disclosure. In 1999, the Companies Act was amended and it included a provision for setting up a fund for investor education and protection. Again in 2002, the Government of India set up the Naresh Chandra Committee on Corporate Audit and Governance. Now this committee completely dealt with how auditors should behave and what, are, what is their remuneration, what is the relationship between company and auditors and everything relating to internal and external audit. And in 2002 again SEBI set up a Narayana Murthy Committee. And this committee also spoke about auditors and their relationship with companies and it also included another unique aspect that is disclosure of risks. 
in their annual reports. So companies were asked to disclose their risks which were there so that investors can be aware of what are the risks this company is entering into and then they can decide whether to invest or not. Then in 2003, the National Foundation for Corporate Governance was set up by the Ministry of Corporate Affairs. Now, in 2003, this was set up in collaboration with the uh, Confederation of Indian Industries, the Indian Chartered Accountants Association and many such other bodies. In 2010 and 2013, even bodies like the National Stock Exchange even uh, partnered with this foundation and they all became trustees of this foundation. So, what is this foundation doing? It ensures that research is done in the field of corporate governance. It ensures that it set up a framework for corporate governance for the companies in India to act on and many such other education and research kind of work. And a very, very landmark event that happened in the corporate governance setup in India was the inclusion of clause 49 of the listings agreement. Now, what is the listings agreement? Basically, if a company wants to be listed in SEBI, it has to enter into an agreement with SEBI. Now, this agreement is called the listings agreement. In this, a clause 49 was amended or it was, uh, you know, made into different terms and it included a lot of new concepts like the need for independent directors, how should the board of directors work and what is the role of auditors and it set up a, a very concrete structure for corporate governance which the companies should follow if they want to be listed in SEBI. Now, apart from this, recently in 2009, the Ministry of Corporate Affairs came up with the voluntary guidelines on corporate governance. So, this is the timeline of the uh, initiatives of corporate governance in India. To sum up what we have seen so far, corporate governance basically refers to ethical administration. It is beyond management and it involves a set of systems and processes. Two main events that triggered the discourse on corporate governance was during the 1990s and 2000s corporate collapses and in the 2008 financial crisis. And corporate governance in India, we saw that so, there were some of very important committees, class 49 and NFCG are important to remember. I would like to conclude this lecture by quoting Professor Bob Tricker who is considered to be the father of corporate governance because he coined the term corporate governance. He said, the 19th century was the century of entrepreneurs. The 20th century is a century of management. And today, the 21st century, we are going beyond entrepreneurship and management into governance. Thank you so much. Happy learning.